Hey there, film fans. I'm Jeff. I'm Dave. And I'm John. And welcome back to The Love of Cinema, a pod in which we'll challenge one another to discuss movies both new and old with a strictly positive critical eye. That's right. And to avoid any lazy negativity, we are making this a drinking game. <laughs> yeah, Drink. that's right. <laughs> any negative criticism about a film is absolutely allowed, but you will be called out for it and you will be forced, forced to take a drink. You will hear this sound. <clears throat> Friends, that means we're drinking. Oh, and dear. we would love it if you at home drink too, but please drink responsibly. <laughs> so pour yourself a glass. <laughs> <laughs> I can't tell you why that's funny. Pour yourselves a glass, join us, and give it up for the films we love, and perhaps the films that need some love. I don't know. Do they need some love this week? Good question. Uh, you have to listen we'll to the rest out. of the podcast to find out. But first, we're going to send it over to John for some shout outs. Ah. Shout outs. All right. As always, we're going to give it up for the beer sponsor, Mr. Carlos Barozo. You can follow him on Instagram at CBarozo Bar 2019. That's C B A R R O Z O B A R 2019. And as always, you can find okay. the music. What? I hope he's doing well. <laughs> we have not I hope he's seen doing him. Well as We've well. been paying for Carlos! beer for a while, but I, Carlos, Carlos, man, we are we are get back at us, Carlos. Up, we man. love you, man. Uh, music, the music on this episode <laughs> and every episode is provided by the artist Da Sign. That's Da Sign T A S E I N. You can find all that music available at SoundCloud.com forward slash Da Sign dash artist. Jeff. Yep. Talk to me. We're talking about the films from 1993. This came up because if you've been following our podcast, we use a random year generator provided by Dave and his technology. <laughs> um, <laughs> in the age by of quarantine. Org, actually. That's right. In the age of quarantine, so that we had um, some kind of context to, to have a film podcast when few and fewer and fewer films are being released. But 1993 was drawn and 1993 was a fantastic year. We're going to talk a little bit, just to give a little bit of context about what was going on in the year 1993 and the reason we chose the films that I imagine you read in the episode title. But first, we just have to stay relevant by going around the room and saying <laughs> what you've been watching and any news stories you want to tell. Dave. Well, did you guys, uh, this is relevant to the episode as well. Um, Tim Burton is developing a live action TV series of the Adams Family. <laughs> no, I didn't. I, I know. I saw Adams Family if on like Twitter. anyone was going to do it, I'm so glad it's Tim Burton. Because yeah. yeah. I mean, that man's mind needs to get loose on Adams Family. Uh, as for what I've been watching, I finished Raised by Wolves. It's, mm. it's like Ridley, let Prometheus go. Um... <laughs> <laughs> And I finished The Boys as well, which hey. is, uh, yeah, they, they released all the episodes finally. Uh, and then a little teaser saying we released all the episodes. Everyone shut the fuck up, please. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so it was, it was a yeah. solid finish. Solid finish. I'm looking forward to next year. John? Nice. I, uh, I only watch these movies. So I've been fucking politics or just taking over you guys. I've just been watching a whole <laughs> bunch of news and following that shit. And I watched these three movies and working the polls this week and everything. So I was not a good movie watcher but I'm excited for the election. How about you? <laughs> I, um, I watch a couple next week, so I, I rewatch The Conjuring. I'm done with The Conjuring. It's a fine movie, but I'm, I'm just, I just don't have it in Why me anymore. Done? I've Why? seen it so many times. Why? I always start this movie, and I'm like, I think this is really good. I'm like, it's the same fucking movie. It was good last time. Like, it's, I'm done with this movie. I'm done with it. Um, and we finished House on Bly Manor, which to anybody who started House on Bly and says, you know, maybe this isn't good, stick with it, because you're right. But it also ends well. I, I just liked the way it ended. I can't really explain it better than that. Wait, so so Bly is not good? So you're, wait, no, are you talking to yourself from last week? No, 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 no. No, because I, I didn't finish it last week. I, I finished it since the last week's That's episode. That's what I'm saying. Last week you were like, I don't know if it's any good. I don't know if it's scary. It's not scary. But, but you liked now, it. But the, the, the last ended. episode and a half, I was like, really brought oh. it. <laughs> interesting choice how many hours of my life do i have to waste before i get to the last <laughs> get the fuck out of here okay great um <laughs> what are you doing on uh, your average tuesday night get the fuck out of here with that okay so um what did i watch the conjuring I, I feel like i watched something else and i can't remember what it was nothing yeah you nothing said it you it. just told us before we started before anyway. other than the conjuring um no the only news is that uh the james bond movie um almost sold for 600 million dollars to a streaming service and decided not to because yeah. they want to wait till next year 600 million dollars to stream 
Now, who has that kind of money? Probably somebody that should take care of the homeless population around this country or maybe help everybody get health care and, you know, make sure that we're not, you know, shooting each other in the streets. But sure, you have six hundred million dollars sitting around for James Bond. Yeah, why not? Um, And then um, on streaming and anyone's wondering why it's eight hundred dollars to watch. That's why. Yeah. Jesus Christ. Um, And uh I forget what else I was going to... Oh, I- I'm really excited about the new B.B. King biopic that um, Wendell Pierce is going to be in. But that's it for news. That's it for what oh, we've been cool. watching. Um, anything else yeah. you want to say before we talk about 1993? Let's fucking hit it, dude. All right, 1993 film year. Yeah. So, number one at the box office. I imagine it was not much of a surprise to you all. What do you think it was? 1993? Uh, yeah. Is it not our, our nope. first pick? Nope. Oh shit! Jurassic no. Park, Jurassic yeah, Park, Jurassic sure. Park, nine hundred fourteen million dollars worldwide. I, I do believe that includes re-releases. But shout out to Jurassic Park. Go get him, mm-hmm. Steve. Go get him, Steve. Mrs. Doubtfire, oh, yeah. number two, four hundred forty-one million dollars. Good, good, good job, Robin. Good job, Robin. Mm, you have the fu- Robin. That was a good film. It's a fucking good film. The Fugitive at number three with three hundred sixty-eight million. Mm-hmm. You have Schindler's List at number four. Really surprising. Yeah, that I that figured was, that like, would be the, top five. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a fun comedy romp it's for the whole It's not a family. rewatch. That's yeah. a one-time watch movie. Yeah. <laughs> um, the Firm, Indecent Proposal, Cliffhanger at number seven. And then you get the, the, the Tom Hanks. That's also a fun comedy romp for a whole different reason. <laughs> you get the uh, Tom Hanks bang bang with Sleepless in Seattle and Philadelphia in the 200s. And then almost the 200, you have the Pelican Brief. That's what you got. Um, if you want to talk about the Academy Awards, for the most part, it was all about uh, Steven Spielberg and Schindler's List. Steve probably felt pretty damn good about himself with mm. Schindler's List and Jurassic Park going into the awards season. Um, you have Holly Hunter and 11-year-old Anna Paquin winning some Oscars for the piano. Oh, you have yeah. Tom Hanks in Philadelphia. He gets his first out of two consecutive Oscars. He somehow beats Liam Neeson, but in hindsight, if we knew Forrest Gump was coming out the next year, they probably would have voted differently. But Philadelphia was a very important film, so shout out to Tom, and shout out to Denzel, who was snubbed. You also have, in the Best Supporting category, something that has definitely been discussed ad nauseum, which is, well, Leonardo DiCaprio, What's Eating Gilbert Grape is in there. You have John Malkovich is in there. You have Pete Postlethwaite in there, which is awesome. But somehow Ray Fiennes does not win an Oscar for Schindler's List for playing Eamon Gerth. I forget mm-hmm. how you say his name because I only saw that movie once and that was enough for me. Um, Tommy Lee Jones wins for The Fugitive um, for a role that was so incredibly moving that they gave him his spinoff. <laughs> they gave a supporting character a good old spinoff from uh, The Fugitive. More on that in a bit. <gasps> yeah, so uh. In the Name of the Father, another fantastic movie of Shadowlands. And you have... Uh, for better or worse. <laughs> and uh, The Streets of Philadelphia, you get Bruce Springsteen gets an Oscar. Who would have thought? And um, and then Jurassic Park won a shit ton of Oscars. I think I, I forget if I mentioned mm-hmm. The Age of Innocence was this year. I was, as was Adam Family Values was this year. Um, any Ooh, any other films that you guys saw that you want to talk about? Search for, search for Bobby Fischer, maybe? Robin Hood Men in Tights, dude. <laughs> nice. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah I give that up. And uh, Dazed yes. and Confused was a Dazed had a huge and, influence yeah. on me yeah. and I think our generation in general. Yeah. Um, yeah. A couple other things going on in 1993 is uh, October 31st, River Phoenix overdose. October 31st, 1993. Um, he was oh, in the shit. middle of filming Dark Blood. Mm. Um, you also have um kim basinger files for bankruptcy because she verbally committed to a movie and apparently that's legally binding in california california's messed up don't get married and don't verbally commit to anything in california <laughs> all of a sudden she was like ad hoc yeah. for like 10 million dollars because she verbally said she would do a movie how many times have you verbally said you would do something can you imagine courts showing up at the fucking subpoena because of it yeah sorry kim um and then a super mario brothers loses a lot of money that <laughs> is it in it's funny because super we discussed Super Mario Brothers trying to redeem that this week, and then we looked it up, and you can cannot it. stream or rent or yeah. buy yeah. Super Mario Brothers right. in the US. Right. I thought we were gonna try. <laughs> it's it's like what what did they did it fucking get banned? Um, maybe. <laughs> oh, that's good. Um, <laughs> no one's walking the dinosaur yeah. this week. Uh, you also have Leprechaun. Leprechaun did come yeah. out this year. And I feel like there's a Disney movie I'm skipping over, but maybe that was like a gap between uh, Beauty and the Beast and Lion King 
that I missed or Aladdin and Lion King. Anyway, we have to move on, people. It is time for us to move on hmm. because we can't talk about The Adventures of Huckleby, Huckleberry Finn starring Elijah Wood and Courtney B. Vance. We can't do it anymore. We have to move on to our first film, which is The Fugitive. Now, I imagine many of us listening to this film, The Fugitive, you know, damn well, was on TV every goddamn day. It was on some channel. If you got those premium packages in the 90s, <laughs> it was on, or U.S. Marshals became easily confused. You're like, is Tommy Lee chasing Harrison Ford or Wesley Snipes? Who is it? And then you see the person and you go, okay, it's The Fugitive. So The Fugitive stars Harrison Ford. And this is in an era with Harrison Ford where he literally goes, bam, $20 million banger. Bam, $20 million movie. Bam, $20 million movie. Like all of a sudden he he owned the 80s. And if you wanted to know what was going on with him in the 90s, he just is like, JFK. He's like, I'm Jack Ryan in Patriot Games. I'm The Fugitive. And it's like, Jesus Christ, man, slow down. So you have... You have Harrison Ford playing Dr. Richard Kimball, who is unjustly accused of murdering his wife, played by Celia Ward. He must find the real killer while being the target of a nationwide manhunt led by a seasoned U.S. Marshal, played by Tommy Lee Jones. And the reason he is on a nationwide manhunt is because somebody else on his bus very conveniently tries to have some kind of uh, on the way to prison trial happens boom you're booked you go from jail to prison you're on the way he's chained in um you have the guy from office space is on the bus ready to shackle him up the jump to conclusions guy and then another guy fake poisons himself so that he can try to get out of jail before ever going into prison. And Harrison Ford, humble doctor who knows he is innocent, uses this as an example to escape and run amok. And then Tommy Lee Jones comes in and tracks him down. Really, really good stuff. Who wants to go first with our discussion on The Fugitive? John or Dave? When was the last time you guys watched this? Let me start that. All the way through? Never, because I'd seen clips of it over the course. Actually, wait, you know what? I missed the news story. A news story this week is that now Nielsen is they're they're giving up on talking about like ratings of who watched each episode and they're just saying total minutes watched for streaming. So like Nurse Ratchet had a billion minutes watched because also like they know that some people watch this, the first episode twice or they only watched half of this episode or whatever. So they just talk about minutes watched. I have so many minutes watched of The Fugitive. How many times have I seen it from start to finish? <laughs> One. And it was this week. <laughs> what about you? Wow. Dave, how about wow. you? It's been it's been so long since I watched this, I actually forgot how it ended. So this was a pleasant rewatch. Oh shit, dude! I watched it. Yeah, yeah I, I watched it's it recently, been a long time, a couple of years ago. Um, I don't know, you guys. I feel like there the, the '90s owns thrillers. Like that decade was the thriller yeah. decade. I mean, there are so the, many the iconic tense. ones. Yeah, uh, Misery, Cape oh, Fear, Air Force Seven, One, yeah. Primal Fear, A Time to Kill, Air Force One, Sounds of the Lambs. I mean, there's so many wonderful ones. And Harrison Ford starred in like 80% Half of them, of yeah. Them. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> and like every time I watch this movie, I'm just reminded that like, this is probably the best one. And there are so many good ones. That's a tough thing to say, but I feel like tough, this movie is structured perfectly. I mean, you are, you can't, the editing is so tight and it has that, it doesn't get too fantastical. And I, I hear what I know what I'm saying. I hear what I'm saying. It opens with that, like, you know, the giant, the bus falling into the. It's, you know, it's still the there, by the way, the road in, and in he, North like, Carolina. You away. can go visit that bus. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they run tours through it. Uh, they did it. That, they, they yeah, actually the whole crashed, thing is practical. The whole thing the is practical. Bus, and they left it there for North Carolina. Yeah. It's really fucking cool. <laughs> The guy, I mean, the, I remember being a child and like seeing the trailer and then seeing when it finally came out and sneaking the VHS after my parents rented it to watch it when I was like eight years old by myself. When he jumps off of that fucking yeah, dam that's a fa- into that water, I mean, that image like stayed with me as a kid. Yeah. So I don't know, but it's not just those big moments. Like a lot of it is Harrison. He's just wonderful. So like any, you, you understand why he was bank- making 20 million bangers because guy is fucking unique. There aren't that many guys who have that kind of type. I want to see him in duress. <laughs> I just want him stressed mm. out. Like he is my favorite actor 
to stress out. He is just so fucking good at it. So a lot yeah. of it's him, but a lot of it is also Tommy Lee, of course, and the acting is great yeah. across the board, but this, the way they edit this motherfucker, the story is intriguing enough so that it will attract a smart audience and an audience that doesn't need intellectual stimulation. The acting is that good. The direction is that good. And the editing is so fucking tight that you really, Dave, I agree with you. I, I think I forget how this movie ends every time I start watching it. Cause I, it's so, it just gets, mm. it just wraps up in itself well, so well. On the, on the subject of editing, this became the first film to have uh, six editors non- nominated for an Academy Award for editing. Yeah. Wow. Probably first and last, right? Yeah. Holy shit. Yeah. Six editors. And there were um, four. Cause they uh, shot that much footage. What it, where's my notes? There were, yeah, there were four, nine writers and six editors. <laughs> nine writers had a pass at oh this. Oh my God. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay. So this might be the only movie that was made by a committee that we could all just. Yeah. He, he, well, no, it was. I mean, the, the director was in charge the whole way along. He he knew exactly what he wanted, and he just basically yeah. kept going, kept going, kept going till he got what he wanted. Nice. He directed uh, Under Siege as well, right? What's his name? His name is Andrew Davis. I think is the director of this movie. Um, I liked that movie as well. But yeah, I don't know, you guys. Tommy Lee Jones. Uh, probably my first big impression watching him in this movie. Same. I mean, yeah, it, it had such a huge impact on me, Jeff. You could probably speak to this as well as an actor. When I started getting more into acting, he's, I will never forget the first time I saw this performance because a lot of times when you see people start trying to act and they're like studying the craft, there is this tendency that a lot of people have to resist speaking quickly. And Tommy Lee Jones just proves immediately that that is absolute <laughs> horseshit that you can do. You can yeah. absolutely fly and people will follow you. You can think and speak in That's... real time and it's captivating as fuck. And it's hilarious. And sometimes it leads to one of the most famous fucking speeches in the universe. All right, people, I want everything. Yeah. yeah I want to church. Yeah. Yeah. Every like, outhouse, house, hen house. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's everybody knows that speech. There's not a single person on earth. Doesn't know that speech. <laughs> the family guy quip. <laughs> Yeah, Jeff, what are you gonna say? Um, I so first of all, Alec Baldwin was offered the role of Richard Kimball and passed. Is the is the news I saw? Not even that he was considered, and they went with Harrison Ford. Apparently, Alec Baldwin passed. So Alec Baldwin, if you're wondering what happened to him after the '80s, poor decisions. That's what happened yeah. to him. Uh, Hunt for Red October <laughs> was like two years before this. So wow, kudos. Um, and then, I mean. Tommy Lee and and so even though they had nine writers, Tommy Lee and Harrison Ford were still fighting for their characters. And this is something that's really interesting that I don't I don't know what happens with that anymore. If I'm being completely honest, you don't hear as many stories about that anymore. But for instance, the the sequence you talked about jumping off the dam um, is a very very famous sequence. In fact, my favorite line in the whole movie, which I, I forgot how well I knew this movie until the things that he says, mostly Tommy Lee, but some. Harrison Ford I go oh my god it's it's as if he like spiked a nerve on me but <laughs> when they're in they're in a tunnel and hmm. they know that the ambulance is empty that Harrison Ford has just stolen and they can't find him so they know he's in this tunnel and then they they can't find him and then, so they look and they see a drainage pipe and so rather than do like a <gasps> Like how how do you how do you now let the reveal happen that they look at a drainage pipe? Tommy Lee just looks at it, picks it up, and goes, "We got a gopher." Mm-hmm. <laughs> he goes, "We got a gopher," <laughs> and then they get in there. Um, but anyway, at the end of the um, the dam sequence, which is a very very famous sequence, Harrison Ford jumps out of the dam. Spoiler, also not a spoiler because you already knew that, you listener. Um, he says Harrison Ford goes, "I didn't kill my wife." And Tommy Lee Jones says, I don't care. <laughs> and the original line that was written was, that's not my job. And Tommy Lee uh, fought for the change. That's not, not my, my problem. problem. Sorry, I, I wrote it down wrong. Sorry. Um, and Tommy Lee fought for it to say, I don't care. Same thing with Harrison Ford. There were a couple mm. um, tiny lines that he said that... Um, oh, my, my other favorite Tommy Lee line is, I don't think there's anything to find. Find it anyway. <laughs> To basically tell people to go back and do another suite. But anyway, these guys are fighting for their characters. They're fighting for their jobs. So these are people that are very clearly invested. So is that a good thing in the long term? I don't know. 
but nine writers and then the actors fighting for their roles you, you know that they care about this project let's put it that way you know they're not just sitting there going was it good let's move on these people really did commit to these performances yeah, and these there, roles there were some discussions that happened there where you usually see when they take long-running tv series and turn them into a movie where they bring a director in and doesn't really know the material and they try right. to get them to do something like my character wouldn't do that. But these guys are having this discussion on their characters on this movie. They've gone so in depth in prep. They're like, no, my character wouldn't do that. And then a discussion happens and it either goes one way or the other. Right. And they did respect some decisions where it went the other way. But a lot of the times they, they it got came to an agreement. that yeah, your character would do that instead. Yeah. And I think, I think it's cool to me. It was probably Tommy Lee being like, I just, I want it to be, a, I want it to be a little bit more personal. Maybe he was tired of seeing these ca- kinds of characters have no family, right? Like, does he have a wife or a, a family? Like, he's always at work, right? Which is fun mm. for us as the audience, but is it realistic? And so maybe little things like that. It's like, at least now we get some motivation. So now you're following this person because there's more going on than just the chase sequence. You know, there's like some kind of just like passion in this person to be a full on fucking Javert. Um, but anyway, I just think it's cool. And, and Harrison Ford, same thing. They argued over the ending and actually Harrison Ford lost. <laughs> mm-hmm. as far as i as far as i as remember but um but anyway there, there was a lot of passion that went into this movie that i think you can very 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 clearly see and that's my favorite part about the movie dave cool i i I love like even down to the way it was shot they used so much natural light where they could um they weren't using artificial film light as much as possible um it just added a a little bit of a real world feel to it it made it some of the shots look spatially lit if that's a thing like too much of the the scenery was lit but it works for the whole product yeah i think that's one reason why this one really stands out this one and primal fear really they've always stood out in my mind is that that realism thing that we've we've celebrated before in the late 80s and a lot through the 90s just the filmmaking style um doesn't feel like like the joel shoemaker time to kill the client and stuff they're a little more beautiful and there's nothing wrong with that but there's a there's a grit to this and i think it just stays through with the rest of the design and the casting like i know they're huge stars especially harrison ford at the time but like you know they would try to get like fucking chris hemsworth or tom hardy to play him nowadays like just these giant superhero muscly ripped guys like there was something very Mm. grounding about the casting in this movie it did feel kind of like a long law and order episode and to a certain extent which kind of, I don't know, gives it this, this other thing that I like. I was also very pleasantly surprised. Uh, I forgot Jane Lynch has a small cameo in this yeah. movie. Yes. <laughs> that was funny. Um, uh, Julianne Moore, one of her, not first appearances by any means, but apparently this was like one of the biggest, more successful movies she had been in to that point and got her some attention. That was pretty cool. Um but yeah, I don't. Joe Pantoliano yeah, say, like, that, for the Matrix that whole crew, and from like, did they like, does, did, did the crew, did that kind of the specialists team, the supporting comedic specialist <laughs> group, like did, yeah. did, did this movie like define that? Because we've definitely seen that a lot since then. I'm trying to think of a movie before this where they really nailed it this well. The lightning fast banter between Tommy Lee and his group. Uh, I don't know, man. I feel, I feel like this movie is just so definitive. It's almost, it's almost, it's hard to discuss this movie because I feel like it has impacted so many other movies that you kind of feel like you're talking about tropes. Yeah. But it wasn't a trope when they did it. I feel like this is just one of the best times they nailed it. Ah, <laughs> I'm glad yeah. Hey, gush, gush That's your heart out. I just finished my beer. I'm gonna get another beer. You guys fucking talk. <laughs> great (laughs) sure um i want to go back to the train wreck because i i actually found i found a special feature that dealt with how they did it and they literally had one take to get this thing right yeah so they Mm -hmm. they had another engine pushing the the train and they it, it actually happens in two sequences um the first is the engine going off the rails uh and crashing and they had like another engine pushing that one and then they let it go and it came in and crashed and then they did a seven car train and pushed that one and it was supposed to hit at about 35 mile an hour and it hit at 42 but and then they specially constructed some of the railing to actually explode outwards and tip the train so that it tipped and derailed but there was no test of this it was all math and theory and the guys working the explosives and setting up this this rig that went yes this will work and they did it and it bloody worked yeah. and it looks fantastic awesome. and 
yeah, it was a whole, like, I think, what was it? Uh, it took them like 10 weeks to plan and 60 seconds to execute. <laughs> Holy shit, basically, yeah. Yeah. Well, now it's a, now it's a tourist attraction. And, and yeah, it's Dylan, in uh, S- uh, Silver. Silver, North Carolina. Silver, Silver North Carolina. I yeah. thought they did it in Dylan. Mm-hmm. Whatever. No, it's it's silver. But yeah, um, it's also uh, on on the other ahead. note of the camera work. Sorry, uh, the uh, the scene with Tommy Lee Jones, um, in the helicopter near the beginning when they're looking for him and he's in the helicopter. I don't know whether you noticed, but that camera moves a little, and you can see the the support holding the the front screen of the helicopter up that cameraman is strapped on the outside of that whole helicopter <laughs> honestly dude i noticed he's shouldering, he's he shouldering a camera on the outside of the damn helicopter to get the shot that's pretty impressive and i noticed in the way they shot that there was a lot of choreography involved with the car in the background through the helicopter so i remember like there were certain times mm. it kind of seemed like tommy lee jones was just kind of riffing but like there it ends with him saying his final line like there like blah 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 and then he, he they like the camera like goes over further to the right and you can see the car come around the bend. And then Tommy Lee Jones turns and says, there he is. It's like, once again, it's just those practical things. They just don't do shit like that yeah. anymore. When was the last time they did like real helicopter shots? Tom Cruise in the last mm-hmm. mission well, impossible. Te- That's well, what, baby. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, Tenet blew up an actual 747. Apparently. Tenet! <laughs> there it is. <laughs> <laughs> we got to see it, you guys. Um, yeah, I have a, I have a, I have a, I have a speech about. We're close. I, I, I thought we're about close. this. They opened, uh, they opened New York, but not New York City cinemas. So New York is open. Great. Just nice. Waiting, we have eighty four thousand cases City. a day nationwide, so it's perfect time to open the cinemas. <laughs> um, I, I was thinking about this during True. I forget. It was True Detective with Matthew McConaughey and something else. Where I was like, the nineties are just the best time for these thrillers because you have all of the accessibility. Technically, in this film in nineteen ninety three, it was kind of before cell phones became mainstream in films. So they, they still use pay, pay phones and stuff. Um, but they're able to do tracking on telephone calls. They're able to have some video surveillance, but also the person can disappear in plain sight if they want to, which Harrison Ford does a lot. Every single government building, for instance, is not under 24 hour surveillance. So we can kind of weave in and out because he is, he is, I mean, Tommy Lee Jones and the U.S. Marshals have paid a lot of money trying (laughs) to catch Harrison Ford. And then at the end, they really shrug it off as if he's not going to have to fill out some fucking paperwork. You know what I mean? We're talking about (laughs) millions of dollars flights helicopters overtime security and <laughs> weeks of and, yeah, this shit going on i was gonna on. say they're looking for him for so long one kid's hair changes um yeah exactly. <laughs> funny um <laughs> anyway the only the only thing about the 90s though which was tough is is some of the technological stuff so for instance the audio work on that fight in the train at the end when harrison ford's in the train and he's uh-huh. almost there they actually have some like psh, psh, sound effects going on like in that train and you're like oh that was, man that they, was they had us definitely the, whole time. the uh that was the 90s uh stock punch fight i sound know and they were that, like uh, five and but this is the year I that think, jurassic park came out where the sound effects were realistic and the, the fucking creatures didn't even exist yet so that's yeah, too I, bad yeah I, I think there was just one company providing punch sound effects in the 90s and they're sitting back on i can't believe they're buying this shit <laughs> and they watched jurassic park and they went shit we need we need to reinvest Anyway, the 90s is a fantastic time for thrillers. Jeff, you're totally right, though. I was When I was watching it, and this always happens when I'm watching the 90s thrillers, I was thinking about how, like, they can't... A, a thriller nowadays, with all of our new technology, almost has to have, like, a sci-fi element to it. Just because... Yeah. To, mm. to pull off... Power yeah, outage uh, is a great uh, one, for it, instance. EMP, like, like, you have yeah. to get around all the electronics nowadays. Like, there was something more pedestrian mm. about the thrillers in the 90s before the, the electronics yeah, got the, so out of control. Like Die Hard with the fire sale. Mm-hmm. When they did the, uh, was it Die Hard 4? Um, then they had the fire sale where all the communications were shut down. Yeah, which is, you know, I mean, yeah. that's it's the cool. only way you can do that. But now. like, there is something yeah. about like, like Harrison, who is like the everyman or whatever. I guess he's not the everyman, but you know what I mean? Like, he can be like the anybody, yeah. the US citizen. Like, that almost is impossible nowadays in like thrillers, right? Like, you have to be exceedingly tech savvy to get away with, with anything. You can't, <laughs> I mean, you can't, you can't go anywhere. Right. So this film, this film definitely has a lot of machismo, right? It definitely has a lot of um, testosterone for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, But it's just, it's just so good. It's, it's hard to explain. It, it it is a little cat and mouse. The the only thing, totally cat and mouse. 
the only thing in, in hindsight is like you know that you're pretty sure that Harrison's innocent, you know. So I, that, that's a layer that I don't even know how they would possibly pull off if you didn't know if you, they, they they uncover it pretty mm. well. I would say, obviously, I'm not knocking the film, um, but as far as like a rewatch, like what's what's the impetus to go back and rewatch this film? I think the real reason is the iconic scenes stay with you and the lines stay with you. Yeah, Tommy Lee after the damn sequence saying, "Why didn't they turn the water off?" <laughs> <laughs> like I, I wrote down that's an amazing delivery i don't even remember it but i'm sure if i listened to it i'd be like oh yeah of course it's so good from start to finish the thing just mm. flies and you are 100 percent with it even though you don't really know what the next step is but that's and that's I, the thing though it doesn't it doesn't fly after a point it it starts with like high action and then it settles down into the cat and mouse sequence which in like which is it, the way it's done should be like really slow and boring but it's right. edited so tightly, it just keeps you there the whole time. Mm-hmm. Like you're kept yeah. there as if it is a high action film because this thing is just paced so well. Yeah. And that was a really cool mis- misdirect when, um, well, I guess it wasn't really a misdirect, but it was a really cool, um, um, it's almost like a, not a, I don't even know what you would call it when the police show up, but they're not looking for Harrison. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was a really funny sequence. Like little things they get, you get away with, you can earn stuff like that in movies and that, hmm. that makes movies fun. The difference between movies trying too hard and movies being fun, like the balance of he's being looked after by the cops and the cops show up to his house, but they're looking for something else. They're looking for somebody else. Yeah. You know what I mean? And they're just, they just skip over the fact that a fugitive is, is, is living there in, in there at the time. He's literally right next there. And they didn't know. They can, you can earn that. You can earn that kind of thing with an audience as long as you know what you're doing. Yeah. As long as you're pacing right and as long as we care about your character. The editing, it, it really is a lesson too, because like, in a way, this is kind of an action movie with the way they cut it because- other than some moments with Harrison where you're with him and, and usually only if there are moments of tension, they almost never like, like so many other movies have, have done positively. This movie almost never lets you go beyond the action of a scene. As soon as the information is delivered or as soon as the act is committed by the character in that scene, they cut, they don't ever sit and react. They don't let characters have a moment uh, at the end of it before they move on. So it effectively I don't know. It kind of makes you feel like you're never quite sure how anybody feels about anything other than is Harrison going to get out of this next situation? So in another way, I just feel like it's a, yeah, just a really good lesson on how to cut together a thriller that doesn't build suspense with like slow tension. This builds suspense by never letting you quite catch up. You're kind of following them the whole time and following them the whole time. Yeah. And I don't know. Really good. And it, it it's constant, it feeds you clues at such a really good pace that uh, at the point where maybe you'd start to wonder, you you're fed something, mm-hmm. yeah. And so it just keeps it keeps you up there. It's a it's like oh oh they just resolved that, mm-hmm. and it, then it moves on and you get a little bit of more you which know, is cat and mouse and then which is so important yeah then they just feed you a little something else which is so yeah. important because I would imagine, <laughs> I mean you feel this way when you watch it that must be how it feels. To be a fugitive, like you never have time to like reflect <laughs> on what's happening yeah. slowly. Yeah. Like you're always like thinking as you go, thinking on the go. And I don't know. I was I was thinking I was very aware of that this time when I was watching it. That that not catching up thing was extremely important. So that by the time they reach the end climax, when he's with Jane and he figures it out, when he walks in, they do slow the film down dramatically. When Harrison finally knows and he walks into that ballroom and he takes his time, the film the pace changes. And I feel like that whole final climax changes as well because you finally have caught up and there is nowhere to run because he's either going to die that night or he's going to get justice. I think that's another reason. It doesn't go all the way to the end. That's why it doesn't feel cheesy for me. It doesn't feel gimmicky because it it delivers something different with that final sequence. And all of us have earned it with him. It's the best I can do, you guys. That's my best. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it, it even like even right from the get go, like there's a the like the opening sequence is almost it's almost eighties yeah. in a nineties film. Yeah. It's like it's like an eighties intro yeah. sequence, but it just this works is, for what it is. It's very obvious that they were like, we want the guy from the from Witness. I mean, <laughs> they were like, we want Harrison Ford in Witness in this. I Clear and Present Danger was the year before, but let's be real. They were like, we don't want to repeat that. We want Witness, but he's a doctor this time. Let's go. Um, <laughs> let's go. Um, I mean, we could, we could, we yeah. Go ahead, Dave. Uh, no, I was just gonna say the uh, and one of the other things. Did you read the story of the parade? Yeah, he, how they did the parade. Where he just where they they did, talk about yeah, the they, union. They, talk about the union. The, oh yeah, the plumbers union where they they like well basically the the setup is that they uh, they were gonna film in the parade. Uh, they didn't let the people in the parade know. They just snuck in with cameras and 
Harrison Ford did his thing and Tommy Lee Jones did his thing, uh, which is why occasionally you can see people literally eyeball Harrison Ford because they're literally recognizing Harrison Ford yeah. in the crowd. But he was, at when he first enters the crowd, uh, walking with the plumbers union. And he actually went and got permission with the plumbers union to walk with the plumbers union. Wow. It's so awesome. It's, I mean, if you've like ever Harrison Ford comes to the plumbers union to ask respect. It's like, yeah. If you if you've ever been near a film shoot in an, in a place that's popular, I remember um the the Amazing Spider Man two is filming on Forty Sixth Street next to Times Square, and what are you kidding? Like every single person was just shouting, like, "What is this? What movie is this? Who's filming it? Who's yeah. in it?" So it's like if you're a movie and you have Harrison Ford and Tommy Lee Jones, like you you just have to shut the fuck up and pretend like you're not filming a movie because as soon as one person knows that Harrison Ford is in the area filming a movie, the whole parade's fucked, let alone your, yeah. your movie. So it's like the, the Birdman story when they were doing the, the walk through Times Square. Yeah. He hired a band, a school band, to come in and play on the other side of Times Square to distract everyone. That's so fucking funny. Yeah. And that, <laughs> yeah, Times Square looks really popping that night at Birdman. Yeah. Anyway, John, any final thoughts you want to send us home with? No, nah, man, this is fucking great. Everybody should watch this. If you have not rewatched yeah, this, you it's should. a yeah, great film so to watch. Fun. This was a renter, right? This was a renter for us. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. This was a renter, yes. Yeah, which is great. Totally. And I, I don't mind at all. I'm, I'm glad I gave Harrison my money. Good. Yeah. That's right. Anyway, people, that was The Fugitive. Give it another watch. It was so good that Tommy Lee, who wasn't even the lead in the movie, got a spinoff where he played the exact same <laughs> character. And somehow he beat Ray Fiennes at the Oscars. So, without further ado, we are going to have a little pee break and a little refill. And we will see you in a second with The Nightmare Before Christmas. Ooh. See you soon, Phil And we're back! Oh, Jesus, so we're back. <laughs> I didn't kill my wife. Definitely clip that microphone. People, we are back. We are done talking about The Fugitive for now. Unless you want to reach out to us on our Facebook page or Instagram or Twitter, you can find yeah. our handles in the show notes. But now we got to move on to The Nightmare Before Christmas or Tim Burton's The Nightmare Before Christmas, directed not by Tim Burton, but by. Not by Tim Burton. Henry Selleck. It stars Danny Elfman as the singing voice to Jack Skellington. Chris Sarandon as Jack Skellington. Catherine O'Hara, two-time Emmy mm. Award winner once this year. You got Greg Proops. You've got an amazing set of people, including Ken Page, who still plays the same character today whenever it's done <laughs> in concert and live. This is the pitch. Nightmare Before Christmas. You know this. It's stop motion. You know it. Jack Skellington king of Halloween Town discovers Christmas Town but his attempts to bring Christmas to his home causes confusion. This is a musical if I have ever seen one. I think in the first 30 minutes there were 12 songs. (laughs) Hamilton Uh, has nothing on this. So, Can you imagine the pitch for this? It's like, hey, we're going to make a Halloween feel-good movie for the whole family just for a challenge. Let's do it in stop frame animation. (laughs) Oh yeah, it's also a kick-ass musical. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, it is. Yeah. The, the songs are both catchy and completely Tim, insane because the time Tim signature Burton, changes every 10 fucking seconds. fucking psychotic overachiever. Tim Burton and Danny Elfman, <laughs> like what kind of drugs do they do together to like get them to sync up perfectly? You know what I mean? So so you got Danny Elfman who hit, made it big in the late 70s and early 80s. And then somehow he ends up writing the Simpsons theme <laughs> and obviously Batman and a couple other big and hits. Before. Didn't have to work after that, but he does. And then he decided Edward Scissorhands. Edward Scissorhands, of course, one of his best. Um, mm. Big Fish, eventually. But anyway, here we are in 1993. Tim Burton has already done Batman and Edward Scissorhands, right? And then a bunch of other things. Be- um, Beetlejuice. So mm-hmm. Mm. we're talking about what do they do next? Stop frame animation um, with a musical. Yeah, of course. And this is the story that you would choose. If you want to do a musical, you want it to be weird as fuck. So this is a very weird show. I'm not gonna. Pre- I'm not gonna pretend like it's not. It's definitely a cult classic. I know. Pe- I do know people who know every single goddamn word to this this entire I mean, movie. Find me anyone who doesn't instantly recognize the theme song. This is Halloween. This yeah. is Halloween. Halloween. 
Halloween. Yeah, I mean, it's it's cat. I, I don't know the tune. I don't know what key it's in. I don't know the time signature, but I think I know it. You know what I mean? Like it's it's yeah. definitely one of those songs. Anyway, enough about me. Who wants to start us off with the Nightmare Before Christmas? Which, by the way, is very very streamable on Disney Plus. It really very, is. Very um, I I mean, do you think Beetlejuice, like the stop frame animation stuff they did there, kind of fed the seed a little bit for how what he wanted to do? I guess so. Because yeah, he, sure. he was I playing mean, he, with it for a talked, while, but. Yeah, he's talked before about how it was when he was in animation school and everything. It was always it had a very special place in his heart. Mm. He always just thought it was so cool. He messed with it a lot when he was a kid. I am in fucking awe of anyone who can make animation like this because it like the amount of patience and like time. I've heard him talk before about the uh, the uh, God. What were those old shorts with dinosaurs? It it wasn't the original Fantasia, but it was like old. animated shorts and it like showed the end of the dinosaurs and i feel like i remember him talking about how that like affected him a great deal but Mm. yeah i don't know there is something uh there is something very unique about stop motion animation which i think plays into obviously tim burton for anyone who doesn't know came from the background with production design before he was able to write and direct his first first movie for disney frank and weenie Mm -hmm. i believe was his first the original frank and weenie um and you can tell with like how much I think we take it for granted, you guys, like growing up, at least, for, you know, I can speak for anyone in, in my generation. You take for granted that Tim Burton has such a specific style of production that, you know, from one frame, if it's a Tim Burton movie or not. Oh, yeah. There are there are instances where he will just like take command of like the color and the shadow in every single frame of that film. Mm-hmm. Um, and just like with examples uh, all through his work just like with Beetlejuice and Edward Scissorhands mm-hmm. this movie is you know I was asking my sister the other day who has a, a young daughter she's like she's not even quite two yet but I'm always interested for, for when friends from people from my generation when they start showing their kids Nightmare Before Christmas yeah because uh, I've had some friends who are like oh yeah they fucking love it and some friends are like oh no no they're too scared I think Tim Burton has this unique ability to make things kind of macabre and creepy, but there's an endearing quality to all of it. It's exactly how Mm. I felt about Scissorhands. It's exactly how I felt about Beetlejuice. I was scared to see them when I was a kid. And then I immediately became obsessed with them because they're not scary. The tone is inviting. It's, it's, it's weird. Yeah. And it's like, it's it's, like, it's not for kids, but it is for kids. Like the, the character design is so well done that you get a different level of menace from, every character like he manages to make these horrible looking characters seem not as menacing but the one Mm -hmm. that might be a villain is Mm -hmm. and it's it's all in that like the the doctor is immediately menacing you're like okay this is a bad guy everyone else who's standing around like the main character has a skull for a face he's not menacing he's friendly he looks friendly he looks a little scary if you're a kid at first but yeah he comes across as as friendly whereas yeah the, like the doctor obviously boogie comes across boogie, yeah, yeah very it's it's just so touching to me because you can it's so obvious and again i, I want to get into henry Selick too <laughs> not really get into it that man also directed james and giant peach and Coraline, so he's just no stranger to this kind of you know the style of animation obviously he knows how to make really good tight movies for children that like i agree with you dave i think all three of those movies have multiple layers for adults and children um, but I feel like this one is so special. Tim Burton wrote this, came up with the stories. He didn't have the final screenplay credit, but he wrote the original poem, developed the characters, developed the project. Henry took it from there. But I still think about with Burton, it's so touching to me because you just fucking know this is how he saw life as a child. Like scary things <laughs> were endearing to him. Scary Sorry, things <laughs> were, were, were fun for him. They weren't, they weren't fun in the way that we might talk about our horror movies next week on our live podcast. There's a little previous shout little plug, out. Plug. Uh, terrifyingly, terrifyingly live. Uh, this is, <laughs> this is a different kind of fun with fear. I feel like he, I don't know. You can just tell how much of a kick he got out of, out of, out of the frightening times of year, like Halloween and, and old lore. Like, I mean, it's fun kind of trying to pick out every single character in Halloween town and, how they initially <laughs> came into the cultural zeitgeist. Uh-huh. My favorite, one of my favorite characters is that the merman with like the deep, 
the English voice. <laughs> you know, you know what I'm talking about. They see him. Yep. You catch him doing like snow angels at one point. Yeah. Just, it's it's funny know. though watching it as a as an adult from like when I watched it when I was a, a little bit younger. Um, but I was still an adult then because I'm real old. But uh, now having <laughs> like moved on and seen more things and stuff like that, like my response to the Doctor character was, oh, that's basically the stop motion version of the husband from Invisible Man. Mm-hmm. Interesting. And it, it's, I mean, it's creepy, an, right? Yeah, yeah. A, yeah. And he's, he's, he's like a really creepy, gaslighting, bad character. But it's also it was one of those. Yeah, it's also it's also tempered with something that just takes the edge off a little. It's one of those perfect examples of kind of, in a way, I think watching this as an adult, it seems stranger I'm, I'm, than it did when I was a kid. Like you know how when you watch kids' cartoons or when you watch kids' cartoons as an adult or anything with kids' animation, you're always like, "My God, we show this to kids! Like fairy tales are fucked up! Like why do we do this for kids?" <laughs> but as a child, you're just sitting there and you you take it with such with such an open mind that mm. nothing is uh nothing is preying on the gross truths that yeah. you know kids don't, about society as adulthood. Kids don't describe it in intent. They take it at face value. It's like bad guy. Yeah. Good guy. I think there's something yeah. about to I, I remember especially appreciating this watch because I hadn't seen it in a while because this is a it's a really strange movie. And I think you're you're right on you hit the nail right on the head when you said it's weirder as an adult than a kid. Um and and and, yeah. and it's not that it's we we've just seen so many other things, so it, it reminds us just how different this movie is from any other movie. Um, it's an hour and eighteen minutes, right? It's very very short. Mm-hmm. Um, yep, it's twelve minutes. It's, it's, right? it's short. It's and it's it flies. There's ten songs, but there's re- pretty sure it's sixteen hours. There's 16. reprises and stuff, so it just it's it's happening quick. But anyway, I was happy that because it says I it's you can't forget the opening two songs if you've seen this movie. So it starts with this is Halloween where it introduces all the characters. It's it's incredible. And then you have um the I want song, which is a very popular musical theater motif where the second or third, but usually the second song is mm-hmm. the leading character basically explaining what they're going to try to get in the rest of the musical. Something's coming from West Side Disney Story. Disney uses that a lot with the Disney princesses. Um, exactly. Uh, part of part of your world. Yeah. Right. The, the I Want song. Famous. I just, I can't wait to be king. Mm. And the I Want song is... Jack, Jack yeah, Lament. It's basically, yeah, Jack Lament. And he's in the graveyard with the full moon in the background. And there's this little um, peak, this little like um, cliff. And the cliff unwinds as he walks out on it so he keeps walking but he stays perfectly framed in the in the moon it's hard to explain but but i imagine a lot of you have probably seen the silhouette of the moon and, and jack skellington it was basically a pumpkin head and then a very like slender narrow body um and so anyway that that's iconic and it's amazing and you get it he he's done too many halloweens with the scares and he's looking for more in life and then he finds christmas town and then he everything's jolly and it's happy and it's fun in a different way the screams aren't as fun this time the happiness is the fun and i was like wait a second is this actually I, did i forget is this actually a movie about like even villains can find love like i was worried about all those like traps that disney for instance would this used to not be a Disney movie. This is a touchstone movie. And then in the early 2000s, Disney acquired the rights and then just replaced all the logos because Disney just comes into town and it just fucking... Actually, it was it, it was a Disney film. Uh, touchstone was an, an affiliated Disney. I point. didn't do my research. That's interesting. Anyway, um, they, the Touchstone logo was replaced <laughs> by Disney. That's as far as my research got. Doesn't matter. Anyway... So Jack basically, play, he becomes Santa Claus. He hires the kids to kidnap Santa Claus, and he wants to be the one to bring joy to everybody, but he hires everybody from Halloween Town. So there's stuff in presents with, like, dead heads and scorpions. And I was like, fuck yeah, of course, good. Because this is a weird movie, <laughs> but I like the idea, and I'm not speaking for Tim Burton or Danny Elfman in any way, shape, or form, but I get the impression watching this where they're like, kids stop just believing what people tell you there's another way of looking at everything christmas isn't just jingle bells there's yeah. more going on to christmas you know and the um halloween isn't just mm-hmm. scares and spooks just ask joaquin phoenix anyway um it's like there there's more <laughs> <laughs> i'm so sorry that was so oh. stupid and so cheap um oh no just for that two of them you get two. So stu- i didn't mean to do it i didn't mean to do it <laughs> What happened? I gotta damn it. it no, I Fuck. I'm sorry, guys. Anyway, um, God damn it, Jeff. 
Okay, so um, long story short is this is very clearly a movie where where <laughs> Tim Burton is is very happy to have kids look at things another way. Anyway, I'm gonna <laughs> pass. <laughs> also, a uh, fun fun point on uh, the, we said that there were, uh, but we were talking about Fugitive. There, there was a first there with the Oscars. This also got the first. It's the uh, only possibly in history, animated feature film to be Oscar nominated for visual effects. Yeah. That was his only Oscar nom, yeah. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. Well, the reason it wasn't nominated for uh, the best animated feature is because that didn't exist until 2002. Anime? F- Wait, I thought it was... Nice. I thought, I thought right. it was... How old do you feel Wait, now? 2002? 2002. Oh, because I, I, yeah, sh- I thought it was like, from Lion. Because Shrek was the first thing nominated for... Oh. I knew Lion King was yeah. a big thing because people thought Lion King would be nominated for Best Picture in, in 94. Anyway, that's 2002. Wow. Yeah, I thought Beauty and the Beast nope, was nominated. Uh, definitely not. Not for animated feature. No, it didn't exist before 2002. Oh, wow. yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm, no shit. There. Jeff, you're totally right, though, dude, about yeah. the um, don't think of things normally. Kids like this had a huge effect on me because as a child, like with with what you're saying, as a child... There's something clean in your mind about what we're celebrating around Halloween and what we're celebrating around Christmas. I'm not talking about religion. I'm not talking about anything like that. Just the tone of those holidays and the way things feel and, you know, this this the sensual aspect to it with decorations and obviously like costumes and stuff and the holiday breaks. And this movie did something that just subverted all of that a little bit. So on one hand, it was kick ass because as a child, you had... You know how you have to kind of wait to watch your holiday movies? <laughs> like, I think even adults do that. But as a kid, you really have to. So I would watch this, like, from Halloween yeah. to Christmas. <laughs> but it did that thing that you're talking about, how it kind of just makes you see all of it a little bit differently. And I also, even though this might fall into one of your tropes, I do kind of appreciate that it is obviously a story of, like, acceptance. Yeah. Of, like, this is who you are and you should accept it. However, who is our protagonist it is like this scary creepy guy whose life goal is to be evil and scare the shit out of people so i also appreciated that there was like this this other element of as a kid i didn't think of this consciously but that you can't change you can't change bad things like kind of i know that sounds kind of deep but like the things that are scary are scary they are supposed to be scary like you have to kind of learn how to how to deal with that and i've always just loved how Burton plays with that and he somehow figured out a way to just slide that right in <laughs> to all of this the children's culture. He almost never makes scary movies for adults, mm-hmm. does he? But like a lot of his creepy stuff exists explicitly for children. Interesting. Yeah. I love the music going in between stream of consciousness and poetry too, if you listen to it. So there's a lot of times that's what I said about time signature before, which sorry if that's stuffy but it's basically when the meter is constantly changing so you never know when the song is gonna you know you know the beat you think you know but like when people actually start singing yep. it's not it's it, it's not following traditional like pop music meters and then there's times where as the character they say something and they're saying it in real time you know that's one of the worst things i hate about music theater when people it's so pre-planned that this whole song's planned that i'm not they're clearly not learning anything from this two minutes of singing. They already have this thing already figured out and rehearsed. But the character says something and then they have to think about it because they're not ready to make their next point. So the music pauses for that or the, or the, or the lyrics pauses. The music keeps going. They, they just do that really, really well so that it doesn't feel it, it's definitely a musical and it definitely feels like a musical, but it doesn't feel like a Broadway musical and it doesn't necessarily feel like a Disney princess musical. Mm. It's just it speaks singing enough and it's stream of consciousness enough that the poetry is earned and it is accessible to rewatch as a full grown adult by yourself on a Sunday morning. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's so yeah. many, there's so much weirdness in there. That's so much it's fun to find. Like on this rewatch again, and looking down the track from the last time I watched it, I, I noticed in Halloween land when he's like, sound the alarm and the alarm goes off and the alarm is the same sound. My cat makes at 3 a.m. in the morning when she's fucking lonely. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <It's the> alarm. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. obviously like someone's gone through and thought about all this stuff. But and I also, did you know um, when they, when Disney reacquired it, 
um they made a 3d print of this thing i thought they so there's a no. three there's a there's a 3d screening of oh it that they have uh, regularly when they when they go out for events and this may be the only film i would ever recommend going to watch the 3d converted version of wow because in 3d that would just look beautiful and if i get the chance i'm gonna go see it um i forgot to i forgot to mention that tim burton was a um a animator for disney in the early 80s i forgot to mention that before yeah. that's probably how mm. <laughs> he had a passion for animation before the live action stuff and obviously he infused it into the live action and it's probably why all of his yes. the backgrounds the backdrops to all of his sets in his films look like animation even fucking big eyes looks like i'm watching an animated movie <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah for sure jeff i agree with you what you're saying though about the time signatures and stuff especially as jack's jack's lament like goes through two or three reprises in this movie and his time signature changes in the verse mm-hmm. pretty dramatically when they're preparing for yeah. christmas and it's just little things like that that as a kid, you know, of course, you don't know shit about stuff like that when you're a child, and you, unless you've studied a lot of music as a child. But most people don't know about that and think about that. And yet there is something unpredictable about it. So even like musically, the little subverted spins that he puts on it creates that element of, um, of, of strangeness that was so welcomed as a child. Because even as a kid, I liked the Disney musicals, but they're very predictable. Like, you know exactly mm-hmm. what formula they're working with. And at that time, when we were growing up, everything sounded like Steven Schwartz and Alan Menken. So you kind of got an idea of what you were in for at the beginning of each song. Whereas these were, I think one reason why they're so, it's lasted so long. Like those people you're talking about, I may be one of them, who knows? Literally like every word to this. It's because there is something so unorthodox about the way they wrote it. I really love the moments where he's getting his little band to play Christmas songs oh, and they play them oh in my the minor. God. In the minor, yeah. I, I didn't even. Some of them are just straight minor keys with. Um... I mean, they, you know, they, they have a minor and then uh, they add in like a tritone and everything on top of it. Like it is. The tritone, yeah, was, the tritone is like yeah. sitting right in the middle of it. And that little, um, that little face that's in the cello is based off Danny Elfman. Uh, it's Apparently mm-hmm. that's like, a, that's like <laughs> created after Danny Elfman's character. Uh, yeah, man, I don't know. This thing really, it just snuck in. I feel like even right now, we're kind of struggling to talk about it in a certain sense. Well, Cause like, there's something you just cannot put your finger on yeah. about why this was so successful. I mean, it's, it's, it's well done. It is obviously a labor of love cause it took what a hundred people three years <laughs> yeah. to finish it. Um, and you, yeah, you don't even start doing stop frame animation unless you fucking love it. Cause yeah. it's, you know, you're, you're talking about 12 image, uh, like 12 motion moves a second right. that you have to you have to do basically so that and it takes if it takes 20 minutes to set each one of those up that's a day's work for a second of film almost <laughs> like you know and it's so it's an absolute labor of love you can tell that that love's come through and he's designed the crap out of every single thing that he's put in it yeah. and even the even the writing is smart like the, right, you know right. the mayor at one point knocking on the door when he's asking for help and he's like i'm only an elected official i can't make decisions by myself <laughs> And it's like there's jokes in yeah. there for like the older people who do this. It's just everything. There's there's nothing that anyone did wrong. This entire thing. Oh, and he's gosh. got the gush alarm. <laughs> he's got the gush. <laughs> Look what he did. Yeah. I, right, did. Right, yeah. This movie and others definitely made me think that mayors were going to be a way bigger part of my life. I really thought I really thought the mayor was uh, every time anything happened in town, the mayor was there on a fucking pedestal and they made big decisions. I really thought mayors were important. Um, also, I think I really like the way you say that. Mayor, word. <laughs> mayor, say mayor, mayor. What do you say? Mayor, yeah. mayor, mayor. I also was it this in The Grinch? Who? What other movies are you referencing where the mayor was Every, Yeah, be? The, the Grinch is another great example. There's just all these fucking mayors. <laughs> The mayor of town. Um, I think the animators, though, I don't think they were complaining about all the time and effort they put into it when Marilyn Manson did a cover of This Is Halloween. So you know you did something right when Marilyn Manson covered your song. Yeah. If you want to know the target demo, for this, it's kids that are going to start listening to Marilyn Manson, I think is probably the target demo of this movie. Um, again, it's very, very strange. To be honest, I put that, I put that song on this afternoon just are to really? hear it because I, I, I knew he did it, but I never actually listened to it. And I'm like, yeah, it's not his best. One of my favorite Christmas videos is the the group of people dressed up in full goth 
outfits that just rock out uh, <laughs> All I Want for Christmas is You by Mariah Carey. It's one of my favorite Christmas movies. Uh, but anyway, obviously we chose this movie because Halloween is coming up and it's obviously a bridge between mm-hmm. Halloween and Christmas, which is ironic because you want it to just be a Halloween movie, but it's about the Halloween people loving Christmas more. So you're kind of torn between the two uh, holidays, but it's definitely weird. I definitely, it's a, it's also kind of a, it's also kind of a lesson though, that like, you know, when you, you're stuck in something that you might not like it, the, like the veneers washed off. It's not shiny anymore. You're not really enjoying what you do and you take a step outside yeah. and try something mm-hmm. else to, to bring the back the freshness of what you're doing. Huh. I also love that Bert, apparently Disney wanted to make sequels. Yeah, no. <laughs> Jack Sellington goes to this holiday now. Yeah, I'm so glad this didn't happen. Yeah, that- we basically have already said this, but this is just... Would you, which one of you said it? Like, how do you pitch this? If it's yeah, your day, yeah. Right? Like, this movie is just so... It's so personal. Like this, It's so weird yeah. and so this strange and personal. Is, There's no like, way... This lightning is not going to strike twice. It's, yeah, it's not going to happen. It's, it's, it's like a perfect example. There's a, there's a reason movies like, you know, this, um, like just off the top of my head, The Last Starfighter back in the oh, 80s, yeah. uh, classic uh, sci fi film. They've been pitching remakes of that for years. And like the original writers and that are like smacking people's yeah. hands, like, no, don't touch it. Um, there's there's a reason that it's one and yeah. done. Like it it's it stands on its own. It's, you don't need to reboot, reboot this. It's not going to be the same. That's, you know, it's a really. So you don't think he's going to make a live action version with Johnny Depp as Jack? No, he's going to make a. He's going to make. He's going to tell me. Jack, um, Jack was in. Um, was it Frank and Weedy? Or he was in Bride, Corpse Bride. He got Johnny Depp to be in there, and he'll just make a third Alice in Wonderland movie or some shit. Um, you know what's really <laughs> a special, especially like stand out in this movie was the lighting, the way they lit mm. these non real sets. That graveyard scene where the Ooh, lighting was cool. so clear, it felt like you could become yeah. a part of the set as a kid you probably just morphed into this scenery like i, I buy it it, mm-hmm. was, it was just so i mean I, i'm telling you guys like growing up with i still struggle a little bit with like pixar's animation like it is sitting right it's in the uncanny valley for me right now it's kind of creeping me out <laughs> i was complaining about the other day like in moana and onward the hair is like really bothering me it's too realistic it's making me uncomfortable uh, there was something yeah. about stop stop motion and regular animation from back in the day that like, I don't know, it does something different than computer generated graphics. And I feel like you're right, Jeff, because this technically sits in 3D, you know, naturally it's a 3D set. They were able to do things yeah. with lighting that actually create a depth of feel that does not yeah. exist. I know that's super filmy, but I think it affected you yeah. when you were a kid. It it, it kind of set Halloween town, Halloween world could have been its own world. I didn't even think of this movie as an animated movie. It was like I was looking through a portal into a different world. And mm. once a year, those creatures come out yeah. into my world and they, they fuck with me. But I don't know. Very effective. I don't know if he said this shit to Disney. I don't know if he just knew this or if he just loves stop motion. But they never do this. And I think it's it's kind of strange. Is it just because it takes so long? Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a huge investment. Like three years, putting a crew on for three years and... Like these are these are few and far between. There's there's been a couple. I think Box Trolls uh, did it as well. They were they were stop frame. Coraline, yeah, Coraline, James, um, and Jack yeah, and those guys. And of course, I couldn't help but think about Parks and Rec when Ben uh, Lazy Tuesday when he makes oh he's out God. of work and he makes this stop motion thing. <laughs> Living in the place where you live. Oh. And they, <laughs> it's just the, on, obviously you haven't seen it. That's Nightmare Before on Christmas. That note, <laughs> Nightmare Before Christmas, people. So this. Is the time of the podcast where we normally introduce the three films that we'll talk about next week, where we use well, our yeah. random year generator. But hmm. we're doing things a little differently That's today, not happening. aren't we, Dave? Dave, you want to tell us what we're in the store <laughs> yeah. for? Well, we're not doing a year next year, uh, next week. Uh, we're uh, we're going to do the show live on Saturday night at Halloween. What? Night. Um, if you haven't seen it, yeah, I did, did I tell you? <laughs> Yeah, Jeff doesn't know we're going what? live. Nobody's um, telling. Sorry, what, what time? Um, yeah, never mind. Um, yeah, no, we're at 8 p.m. on Halloween night. Uh, that's New York Eastern time. Uh, we are going live for two hours or as long as it takes us to get through the four movies we're going to, we're going to be doing. It's going to be all horror. Uh, we're having two special guests, uh, a friend of mine, uh, Ryan Wilson, who uh, I've worked with before on film. He was actually in the first film i ever wrote 
it's uh yeah uh, it's it's stored away in an archive somewhere no I we want to see it, it. but uh, <laughs> i smell a redemption but, uh, <laughs> hold on, hold on. <laughs> it's the first thing i ever wrote it needs it um <laughs> but uh mm-hmm. he's yeah he's uh he's a lot of fun he uh, works in a lot of entertainment a lot of a little bit of film uh, and uh, we've also got uh, up and coming horror director Marcus Slebin dro- joining us. Uh, he's going to be uh, talking all things horror. And we're going to go through three good horror movies and try and redeem one live, uncensored, uncut. Are we going to be able to announce any at sure. the end of this? Yeah, we can announce them at the end of this. Awesome. Yeah, we'll tell you what movies we're doing at the very end of the episode, as usual. Yeah. But- Tune in next week, motherfuckers. It's going to be so yeah, much fun. We're live, and we definitely want to encourage you. We might be putting out some questions into the uh, social media universe. We're going to make sure you can go in and type into us. Of course, this is going to be a Facebook live thing. So you're going to have the ability to comment on us and pick on us and talk shit about us and tell us what your favorite horror movies are. Yeah. And Heckless. hopefully we'll get to chat about that as well. Yeah. <laughs> So it's it's live. Week, We're Saturday. doing it live for a reason. We want you guys to turn up. We want you to join, uh, join in and uh, yeah, interact with us. Yeah. But well, without further ado, film fans, we'll be right back. And we're going to talk about our final film of the podcast, our redemption film, The Last Action Hero. Was it really that bad? See you in a second, film fans. We're back. We're back. God damn. <laughs> <laughs> and Joe's brains just came out his nose. Aren't you, aren't you glad you don't have to edit this podcast together? All right, people, we are here in our redemption segment. But first, might I remind you that at the end of this segment, we are going to announce the Halloween films that we are going to be discussing in our live show. So stick around because you can watch some movies this week if you have some free time. And you can, you know, be on the same page as us when we do our live show with our incredible special guests who have seen even more Halloween films than us. So that's going to be awesome to have them on. All right, people. But we have to get into our redemption segment or was it really that bad? Now, this film has it was was a bomb at the box office. It lost almost 20 million dollars. It has a 6.4 on IMDb, but I feel like it's because we love Arnold Schwarzenegger. (laughs) um the although you wouldn't know it (laughs) from previous episodes (laughs) well that was you know that was one of his first movies and he played the violin and you know it was it wasn't really arnie's i'm just saying we've got to be nice arnie's gonna come to come to my door or something well as long as we're not his mate i think we'll be okay um let's uh, (laughs) oh Hey, that's on him. That's on him. Cheating on your your wife is different than the other one. The other one, I I am still, I still feel a little bad about. Let me go back to the IMDb pitch for what the tagline of this movie is. Are you ready? With the help of a magic ticket, a young movie fan is transported into the fictional world of his favorite action movie character. Now, who do you think that favorite action movie character is? It is... Arnold Schwarzenegger as Jack Slater. What a good early 90s action (laughs) star name. This movie has everything. It has Arnold Schwarzenegger getting in a fight with himself. His character, Jack Slater, fights the real-life Arnold Schwarzenegger. You have Arnold Schwarzenegger making fun of himself in the fictional movie world, when they go to a movie rental place, there is a Terminator 2 poster that says it's starring Sylvester Stallone in Terminator 2 instead of Arnold Schwarzenegger. I don't, know, I don't know if you remember, actually. That was right in the middle of the, like, it was, you oh. know how you have the uh, Hugh Jackman, Ryan Reynolds bromance thing going on? Well, Arnie yeah. and Stallone had one of those as well. They were taking pot shots at each other in movies constantly. Yeah. Aww. It's funny. Yeah. Actually, what's, what's really funny is when the kid tells Jack Slater, who is Arnold Schwarzenegger's action character in this film that this kid has found himself in thanks to a magic fucking ticket. He says, (laughs) damn it. He goes, see, Sylvester Stallone wasn't in Terminator 2. And Arnold Schwarzenegger goes, yes, he was. And I believe that was one of his finest performances. (laughs) 
<laughs> it's so ridiculous. Anyway, this is really funny. It's also this is the director of Die Hard that made this movie, and he makes and fun of the e- oh and Predator, God. yeah. But he but he makes fun of the ending of Die Hard, where um, if you've seen it, Hans Gruber played by um, Alan Rickman. Alan. He, he's dead. He's he's dead, and then he comes back to life after about five minutes of st- of com- complete stillness, no rigor mortis, and all of a sudden he's back to life at the end of Die Hard, and they make fun of that in this movie. They call that out. They're like, yeah, just like in Die Hard, or the, even the bad guy, you think he's dead, and then he comes back. So anyway, there's a lot of um, making fun of our, themselves, a lot of like you know elbowing each other and winking, and and I mean Arnie got so desperate, he got Sharon Sh- Sharon Stone. To have a cameo as her character, um, Trim, um, I forget Doctor Tremel from Basic Instinct, which Arnold Schwarzenegger and her apparently didn't get along on the set of True Romance. Hmm. Tremance, um, no, Basic um, Instinct, Basic, Basic. Instinct, no, no, oh, oh you're them? talking about um, um, Total Recall, Total Recall, yeah. But so even though they had bad blood, she did the cameo for him. That's how desperate he was to get his fucking cameos in for this movie. You have MC Hammer as a cameo in this movie. You have um, Robert Patrick, um, Little in there. Richard. Yeah. So anyway, <laughs> sorry. Okay, I'm rambling now. But anyway, this movie it's supposed to be good old action fun and a blatant excuse to use ridiculous special effects. That's what the movie really is. How can we use as many ridiculous effects as possible? Make fun of action movies while we're filming an action movie. That's basically what it is. Who wants to go first? Was it really that bad? Last action hero. By the way, not the last action hero. Yeah, just, just last, last action, hero. action hero yeah. as available on, Look, I think, this stars. Is, this is Arnie at his self-deprecating best. He really fell into his own style in, in these sort of films like where he, can, he realizes he can take the piss out of himself. And at some point, they moved on to all the action guys just kind of having fun with each other. Did you know they paid to put a movie promotion on a NASA rocket for this? <laughs> yes, I saw that. <laughs> they the painted first... the they painted the damn thing on the side of the NASA yeah. rocket, but it had technical issues <laughs> and couldn't take off until oh. after the movie had already bombed. Yeah, it's too bad. I mean, you guys, this thing came out a week after Jurassic Park. Yeah, like, it's not yeah. fair. Yeah, you know, they, 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 they picked a, a they chance. picked a really bad time. But I, I I mean, the one thing I did like is they had so much to play with because the nature of the story allowed them to pack every action movie cliche and cameo yeah. and reference i mean in up until a point it was ahead of its time the world was not ready for this level of self-satire yeah. these days you it, can really get away mm-hmm. like deadpool gets away with it look great but um yeah. they were not ready for this at the time and i think that was one of the things that kind of worked against it yeah deadpool is better because it was an adult as the narrator it was too bad that it was a kid it's it, it is in hindsight it's cool that it was a kid because it's like oh you, movies can be whatever i want them to be but if mm. it was a grown-up that was a little perverse it probably would have been more fun if i'm being honest yeah i mean schwarzenegger as hamlet though is something you just want to see I, that's what i wrote i wrote that down i mean schwarzenegger as hamlet this thing had me from hamlet like i laughed out loud several times i really yeah. liked this movie you guys i thought it was to be really or funny. not to I mean, be not to be to <laughs> be <laughs> I mean, when and, uh, he first the, the, pulls the gun out, he's just yeah. everyone in Hamlet has swords except for him. He's just <laughs> shooting <laughs> them all. <laughs> but no, and I'm going to explain reasons he's got an Uzi. It's like, yeah, I just, mean, come and a on, cigar. He's, so he has a cigar, oh, yeah. which is a term. I'm sure that's a little bit of a term. But, there's, but there's yeah, even, it's a cigar. There's even really subtle things. Uh, they even, like, for one sequence, one stunt sequence, they got Al Leong, who is one of the greatest fucking movie henchmen of all time. This guy has like 72 acting credits and I'm willing to bet that over half of them are henchmen. He's in Die Hard. He's in uh, fucking everything that has like a, a bad guy who has henchmen. This guy turns up and he's on the car when they come up to like, just after they've blown up his uh, his favorite second cousin's second, house. Second house. cousin's house. <laughs> So funny. And yeah, one of the guys in the car is Al Long, who's is very he's very famous as a henchman. And they got this guy to do a I cameo. Uh, but like ev- like they got the T2 to walk through a scene. Like there's ridiculous stuff yeah. like a cartoon cat is <laughs> the cat is <laughs> voiced by Danny DeVito. Come on. Yeah. And he'll be yeah. back here tomorrow. Yeah. When it's, I mean, that's funny. There are so many F. Murray Abraham who oh, won an God. Oscar for Amadeus, and they say, This is the guy who killed Don't Mozart. Yeah. 
killed Mo, Mo's, Mo's art. Mo's who? Mo? It's like, I don't know who this Mo is. And this is literally the guy who won and, an Oscar and then they, for then they killing Mozart. Fucking, then they sneak Mozart into the soundtrack constantly wherever yes. he's around. <laughs> okay. they, they did that a lot, apparently. Apparently they teased themes to a bunch of different movies. Oh, yeah. This. Yeah, the, uh, when, the, when like the cops a... get blown up and uh, the, he's up in the tree. And the, the kid's like, yeah, he survives with minor injuries, but the two cops are dead. And the, the cop's up in the tree, and he's like, two days to retirement. And they play the one of the riffs from Lethal Weapon. Yeah, the Lethal Weapon. It's, it's a, <laughs> yeah. The chief. The and chief of course, is hilarious. And, and, it was the, and it was the black cop. The, the chief is hilarious, yeah. Yeah. Uh, there are just so many funny ones. I laughed. I really about pissed I myself. I, I, he, I actually him and the kid, Him and the kid peel out of a parking garage, and Arnold just drives up the one-way... And then just cuts over a median for no reason at all and yeah. causes like a car wreck. Hey, I've done I mean, that in so LA. Many, uh, there are just what so is, many good what is, tropes. How many cars go upside down in midair and then land on their wheels in this movie? Yeah, I mean, how many how many cars explode for no adequately explained reason? <laughs> when he drives off the, when he like dodges something and he drives off the freeway mm-hmm. and lands on the, I mean. I don't know. Yeah, Ridiculous. I mean, even the lo- my- even some of the locations are in jokes. Oh yeah, I feel my- like this movie for me was uh, it was like Cinema Paradiso meets Die Hard. <laughs> it was <laughs> like I kind of I didn't mind that the kid was the narrator because it did have a it did have that magical kind of endearing quality that like so many early '90s movies had that are through the eyes of a of a child, and I don't know, just the whole the whole relationship with him and the mm. projector was really cool. Like none of it, it was all super absurd and stupid. So I didn't take any of it. You know, I feel like they weren't trying to be taken seriously at all. I mean, the, the yeah. list of movie, that? like the list of movie references is amazing. <laughs> it, it like it's, they've got Die Hard, Lethal Weapon, Terminator, Basic Instinct, The Goonies, E.T. gets a serve. Mm-hmm. They, they actually, I think it was 68, 68 official, officially counted movie references, which makes it one every two minutes. In yeah, the film, I liked that the basically. kid. <laughs> I liked. I liked that the kid had a wide range of taste. That he wasn't yeah. just. He loved yeah. movies. He didn't just love action movies. He was referring to like all kinds of movies. Um, are you, there's um, also a chicken reference, which I'll count to Rebel Without a Cause. Shout out to a recent episode of ours. My favorite, though, my absolute favorite, is there is a chase sequence where Arnold Schwarzenegger's <laughs> favorite second cousin gets turned into a bomb and blows the house up. This is the exact sequence that Dave just talked about a second ago where the two cops are dead and the kid guesses mm-hmm. it from the theater. And this is the sequence where the kid is now going to rub his magic ticket and he's going to become a part of this movie, basically. And <laughs> Arnold Schwarzenegger shoots a guy and somehow the the human man that Arnold Schwarzenegger shoots flies into an <laughs> ice cream truck <laughs> and... And the ice cream truck explodes when the but guy no hits the ice cream truck. Yes. It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> and it is unbelievable. Also, Arnold Schwarzenegger is driving while looking backwards, firing a gun and doesn't get in an accident, which they also call out. I mean, it is. Yeah, it's very it, self-aware. It's so funny. Also, shout out to Charles Dance, who is Tywin Lannister. I, I, I'm going to say it here and now. I loved Game of Thrones for the first six seasons so much. I pretend the last two didn't happen. And Tywin Lannister is my favorite character. And that was my favorite performance by Charles Dance. Um, by, yeah, and, Until and he just, this movie. He's so, so great. <laughs> Charles Dance is so good in this movie as the villain in the, the actual movie who mm. finds the ticket and then goes back into the real world so that Arnold Schwarzenegger's character has to go back into the real world. And then Charles Dance tries to kill the real Arnold Schwarzenegger, which is how that little you know confrontation happens between Schwarzenegger and his character. Um, but he apparently was given the role because Alan Rickman turned it down. Because <laughs> Alan Rickman, again, die, same director as Die Hard, um, asked for too much money. I guess he was tired of playing villains in this director's movies. Maybe Alan Rickman just wanted to break out from that a little bit. And so Charles Dance walked around set with a shirt that said, I am cheaper than Alan Rickman. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. He has, he has maybe my second favorite line in this movie, which is when he goes back into the real world and he's in Times Square, and this is Times Square pre The Lion King. So this is when Times Square was basically just prostitutes and mobs. 
and he kills someone and nobody cares. <laughs> and yeah. he says out loud, I've just killed someone and I did it on purpose. <laughs> I, I have wait. just shot someone and yeah. I did it on purpose. And I, I, I just to follow up to that, only in New York City would an appropriate response to someone yelling, I've murdered a man and I want to confess be, hey, shut yeah. up down there. <laughs> but I'll, I'll tell you the, i'll tell you one thing though when, when says they, the person when, who decided to move in above times yeah. square when, when, <laughs> be, please be quiet sir like. when they did move into <laughs> the real world everyone except that character lost me a little like i i feel like arnie didn't really translate over too well and i was i was watching it and i was like he's not really selling the like finding out he's a fictional character, all that sort of stuff. He's, he, he, I mean, it was there, but he wasn't really selling it for me. And I was mm-hmm. str- almost thinking, wow, imagine if they got Bruce Willis to do this. Oh, interesting. Because I, I, I feel like Bruce has the acting chops to pull that off, whereas Arnie, it was, it was almost there. You like, you, you just wanted it a little bit more. I feel like it would have been if, if he could have just sold it a little better. The the whole second half of the film would have worked for me. But it, it sadly it just kind of once they get you out of them uh... once they get like well it goes from all this fun and constant gaggery and like it's it's joke after joke after joke and reference after reference after reference and then snap you're out in the real world and suddenly it's a real story and it's it's like oh, I didn't I, I wanted more of the other stuff. The only really good part yeah. though, I agree with you. <laughs> but the only really good part about the real world last twenty five minutes is when they make a reference to Ingmar Bergman's Seventh Seal and Ian McKellen walks <laughs> Ian McKellen out of the movie is dead. Is dead. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> dead. yeah, that's funny. I was, I was like, is that Patrick Stewart? Yeah. No, that's not Patrick Stewart. I was like, I need to hear him speak. <laughs> it's like, what the fuck is Ian McKellen doing in this? The la- How many times has he held something in, in the Ma- shape of a staff in, in movies? Yeah. <laughs> Ian McKellen probably had a Broadway show at the time, and they're like, hey, you want to come do this? Honestly. <laughs> I think he had just done like Richard the Third yeah. came out like this year, right? <laughs> like his his film version of this. They were like, "Hey, what are you doing?" Uh, hey. I agree with you though, Dave. If we're being real, I had way more fun in the first part until it actually tried to turn into a story. Yeah, like I just I didn't really care about the last. Yeah, half. Yeah. Was, it, was, it was doing so well. With, laughed, yeah, it was doing so four or well five with times the in the first half. And then it just kind of it tried to be something else halfway through, and it yeah it doesn't. Which kind of bothered it, it me because a little. I, it's kind of bothered me because I thought they were, it kind of, I thought that they were going to try to turn the world of movies on its head from the inside. Mm. And I feel like they took the the low road by coming out and making yeah. it like in the real also, world. Like, um, don't get me wrong though. Like when he, when they come out, like it's, it's basically the, the whole section where he is trying to deal with finding out that he's a fictional character that's the only part about that I didn't like. I feel like they should have cut that down and kept going because like the resolve at the end, like where where they go to, he gets in a fight with himself and then they bring out the other movie villain and all the rooftop stuff. I loved all of that. It was just that one tiny little section where he's dealing with the fact that he's not real. He's a fictional character. I didn't, that didn't sell for me. Everything yeah, else okay. is great. So a, movie, a movie with 38% on Rotten Tomatoes, and we're like, this one little spot didn't quite sell no, for me. Well, I, think, this I is, think it's like a good redemption. I feel this like we is were, a, we're, this, is, this is a great, it's it's a fun watch, and then it gets, it, yeah, I don't it, think it, it kind, deserves of, the kind of does a thing it, like where it's like it's holding at a high level, and then it just drops a little bit, and you're like, eh, and then it comes right back again. So, like, get through yeah. it, and like, there's a dip in the middle like of it. The, did you like the funeral scene where the, the entire family pulls out guns? <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> the mom's okay. ridiculous. Uh, that yeah, that like... is about the time that my wife sat down on the couch. And <laughs> I, that's I, where she and started. I, I, I yes. paused, no, I paused it and I, I hit play. And I'm trying to remember what section it was, but she actually did a full laugh out loud, almost fell off the fucking couch. That's really so funny. It, yeah. in that So se- in that sequence. When the grandma's and, and he still dodges all the bullets. All there's the bullets. like sixty there's people. So many shooting. bullets. <laughs> he dodges do you, every one of them. Do you think what is know. it about when people um they always know how to use elevators and service elevators in these movies? <laughs> so guns are firing and people are dying and they get in the elevator, they know exactly which button to push, and the buttons work. 
a correspondent. I've been in so many just simple, easy elevators with like three buttons that did not work. And these guys, like mm. machine guns, helicopter fire is coming in, yeah. and this thing closes and goes right to where they need. Yeah, they can just, end it and, and leave whenever they want. It's really just funny once. Stuff. I want him to run in, and there's a guy in the corner peeing. You know? Sorry, I ride the subway a lot. It's <laughs> ridiculous. But like, well, the, well, I mean, the other thing I love is like when they're trying to justify. Oh, like he's the kid's trying to justify it as a movie, and he's like, "Well, okay, where are the normal people? Like, look at this. Look at this girl. She's she's really she's really attractive. Like, where it, it's because this is a movie. It's like, no, this is California. Yeah, <laughs> yeah like- that one. Was, no, that that is yeah, that is exactly just. There's not a like single normal looking woman. I will say that probably doesn't translate as well to some of our female viewership. It is definitely they're definitely taking that too far. But having said that, if I'm being completely honest. If you've been to Los Angeles, it does sort of feel that way, where it's like the people in L.A. Not, not oh, yeah. This is not me, yeah. my perception. The people in L.A. have this understanding that you got to you got to do something. You got to go for it. And, and, and it's satire. And, and, and that might turn off. They, some I mean, people. they would you no, know, they would no, They were definitely taking a shot at L.A. itself in that oh, in that sure. sequence. Yeah. Yeah. I will say everybody. I agree with what you said about the Bruce Willis thing, Dave, but uh, everybody in this movie knew exactly who they were. Like uh, everyone played into the satire really well. Mm-hmm. The guy who plays the the main ga- Vivaldi, the main gangster at the beginning, like the the yeah. This movie like opens with a villain's monologue, <laughs> <laughs> like with him just like telling telling him the what he's going to do to him in the beginning. I love I love when the the actual villain is monologuing and the kid pulls a gun on him. He's like, "You just made the classic villain mistake," and then he proceeds to do exactly the same thing and get caught. <laughs> yeah, that yeah. is true. I mean, the commentary is good. I don't know. It's hard to talk about a comedy, I guess, without just quoting it incessantly. Yeah, I know, right? Yeah, I was really impressed so with many, a lot of this movie. Yeah, there it blew, so it impressed me. In here. Yeah, I was impressed. I have it. never seen this before. I like have always resisted watching this in yes. the Arnold canon just because it has such a bad grade. Yeah. I am going to give this yeah. a six, maybe seven, and I don't think it hmm. deserves thirty eight percent. Yeah, I'll give it you. a good six. No, yeah. I feel I feel like if you went and saw Deadpool and you laughed at Deadpool, you'll probably enjoy this to a lesser yeah. extent, but you'll yeah, still just, enjoy it. Realize realize yeah. how much Arnie was just like trying to have some fun. You know Everyone I mean? was just, having some fun on this movie. They were just having fun. Don't take it but, so seriously. It's, it's I mean, fun. well, the the thing that I mean, that's what makes it work, though. When they're in the film, they're taking it a hundred percent seriously. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, they well, are, every, it's like there's <sighs> gags flying left, right, and center, but everyone's a straight man. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's Slater! just it's fun. Yeah. It's fun, <laughs> and this is on um this is on stars. So it is on stars. I, think, I say give it a watch. I think this is a good. We could go on about this as well, but I think this is a good we place for everybody to, just, just to, to put it, it up. Yeah. yeah, give it a, give it a view. We got to save a little bit of energy for next Saturday. This is a oh, short week for us, so uh, <laughs> next Saturday is gonna be off the hook. Dave, are you ready? Are you ready to introduce all the films so that everybody right. who wants to can catch up? Okay, so what we did was we've got uh, we have five of us on the show next week. Uh, we gave our two guests the opportunity to choose what movie they wanted to bring to the party. We chose one. And then, of course, we picked a redemption, a redemption film. Um, so we are going to talk about the original Nightmare on Elm Street. Oh! Yeah, we're going right back to that. And then we're going to talk about a film that Ryan suggested, which where is Candyman, nice. which, Classic. yeah, I'm a little apprehensive to watch because last time I watched that, oh, I was like, oh. I'm excited anyway, to anyway. watch it tonight. And Marcus suggested this really obscure film that can be found on YouTube uh, called uh, Neon Maniacs. Apparently, it's one of his favorite films ever. He watches it every Halloween. Um, so, yeah, give it a look. And we're going to talk about it next week. And we're going to try and redeem one of <laughs> one of the... I don't, it's, we're going to redeem Jason it's X. Jason X. X. We're going to redeem pitch? Jason X. Yeah. The 
tenth if you're a film in the Friday the Thirteenth. It may take place in space. And if you it's if you are concerned, century. do I have to watch? Do I have to watch all the Jasons leading up to it? The answer is no. No, you just need to no, dive in, no, get wasted, don't. watch yeah. that terrible fucking movie, and listen to us talk shit about it. Yeah, uh, just uh, we and uh, yeah, who knows? We might uh, we might even try something with different with the. Was it really that bad next week? Uh, I'm going to prove to you. I'm calling it right. I am going to prove to you that that movie is brilliant and that we are all wrong are about you? Jason X. You're, you're ready to do it? Is, I'm excited. I'm, I'm really I'm I'm super stoked. Wow. Super he's, stoked. He's, put, he's, he's, he's basically just slapped us with a glove. All right. <laughs> Get the fuck out of here. All right, people. It is time for us to say adieu for tonight. Thank you so much for joining us to talk about some films from 1993. Next week, Halloween 2020. Three days before the ele- four days before the election. Can't wait for that. Guys. I don't know which is scarier. Which is sc- nothing is more fucking terrifying <laughs> than that. People. John, Dave, and Jeff saying good day and good night. Peace. <laughs> <laughs>